We're back. Episode 20, The Clinical Dose. Vince, we have five delicious questions. We do. Let's get straight into it. Let's do it. Question one, when did you feel it was the right time to start a second store and why? From Juzzy23 from Instagram Q&A. Ooh, this is a good question, man. It is, yeah. This is, uh, but, well, I mean, especially considering everything that's happened in 2020, where yeah, we closed, closed all, all the retail them. stores and mm-hmm. now opened all the retail yeah. stores back up. Um, Juzzy23, I'm going to answer, like, literally from my own experience. Yeah. Which was actually before you were around. Yeah, before we opened, I was around. Uh, DC? Well, it? yeah. If we, let's, talk, let's talk standalone retail stores. Yeah. Uh, we did Dern and Court in 2013, which was the first retail store and is, like, the flagship retail store. And then two years after that, mm. we did uh, Massive Joe's Gawler, um, which, which, was, which was store number two. Yeah. And... My personal experience with it, and that's what I'm going to speak uh, to or speak from, was we got to a point where we had the resources to be able to open a second store. And when I speak about resources, and especially the business when it was that size, it was a much smaller business than Mm. it is now, uh, was primarily financial resources. Because to open a retail store, there's a lot of expenses associated with doing that. Obviously, you've got lease expenses, legal expenses, set up expenses just to sign a lease. Mm. Then you have fit out expenses, which is to fit the retail store out, which is, you know, you know, can quite easily get into the hundreds of thousands of dollars. I can't remember exactly what Gawler cost us. I think it was a little bit less than that because it's a mm-hmm. smaller store, yeah. but it was still a significant amount of cash up front before you've even sold anything. Yeah. And then you got to put inventory in the store which is multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars again, uh, depending on the size of the store. So that's really, you know, in the way that we went about it and the sorts of um, uh, variables that were taken into the decision-making process to open the second store, it was primarily like, when do we actually have the financial resources to be able to do it? Um, at that time, mm. you know, the HR resources are not that big a deal because we needed a new store manager and uh, casual retail store assistant. Mm-hmm. That's how we used to run the HR side of our retail store. So that was, you know, I guess, you know, recruiting, yep. um, which is still, you know, another process, but wasn't necessarily a barrier. But that was really the barrier was financial resources. And once we had built up the financial resources to be able to do it, that was really the trigger to go and open the second retail store. There you go. And I think that a lot of, you know, smaller businesses are going to come up, you know, that's, that's really going to be the decision making process. Yeah. We can go down the rabbit hole of, you know, where do you put the next retail store? How do you decide the location? How do you decide that there's so many different variables that we can discuss. Um, but I think just as, you know, how we got to that decision to go from one standalone retail store to two to three uh-huh. and probably the first five were very similar. And then we kind of got to the size of a business where we could access financial resources a lot quicker. And we did in 2018, Mm -hmm. we did four retail stores in a year. Um, And that's just a a good contrast to go, you know, from 2013 to 2000, like it took us two years to go from one to two. And then we did four in one year. Yeah, it's (laughs) a big difference. Yeah, big difference. But, uh, But I hope that answers the question. Beautiful. Next question. Should subs be included in your daily tally, tally of macros from Southport 1985 from Instagram Q&A as well? Ooh, what do you reckon here, Vince? Uh, I mean, it depends what subs you're taking. Mm. Um, if you're thinking of your proteins and stuff as subs, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and it depends kind of where you're at in your dieting as well. If you're dieting and you've always tallied mac- um, subs in your macros, I would yeah. say yes, personally, in, yeah. in, in your calories. Um, Otherwise, probably not. I personally don't. I do my protein, mm. aminos and stuff, I don't worry about because they're so, they're so small mm. um, in terms of, of a percentage um, that I personally don't worry. Yeah, I think there's, there's really two trains of thought here. The one train of thought, let, let, well, firstly, let's take like foods, yep. protein Proteins. powders, mass gainers. Carbohydrate subs. Carbohydrate subs. Yep. Those, you have to count. Yeah, Because 100%. they're significant additions to your daily macronutrient intake. Yeah. So let's just take all the food-based supplements uh-huh. and put them over here and say, yes, 100%, you need to account for those in your macros. Yeah. Then let's take everything else. Mm-hmm. Pre-workouts, aminos, fat burners, yep. 
everything else that's not a food-based supplement. And there's really two trains of thought. The first train of thought is, yes, count everything. Yeah. The second train of thought if, is, if things are consistent and they don't change, yeah. that kind of sets your baseline, and mm -hmm. provided they don't change, you don't have to account for them. Yeah. Me personally, I sit in between the two. Okay. So, yeah, and this, uh, let me just specify, this is when I'm in pre-contest. Yeah. Right? Because yeah. off-season, I, I have my diet and I know what I'm trying to hit, but yeah, snacks happen. Yeah. You know what I'm they saying? Do. Yeah, so, they, they definitely yeah. do. <laughs> That's a part of being in, in, uh, in grow season. But when I'm in pre-contest, I account for protein from my amino acid supplements. Yep. I don't count macros or calories from anything else. Okay. Yeah. So I, I yeah. For me, like yep. aminos, BCAAs, because I consume so many of them during the day, they yep. do actually make up a significant amount of my overall protein intake. Just to add on to that, mm -hmm. um, grain supplements, because they kind of sit in between as well. Most of them will have some carbohydrates in yep. them. Do you, can, would you account for those as well? I don't, you because don't. they're consistent, because I take them every day. There you go. But yeah. I do my aminos as well, so it doesn't really make sense. Yeah. But that's just the way I do it. Yeah. So I don't, yeah, I don't <laughs> count my aminos or anything like that. Proteins, carbs, all those foods yeah. I do. Everything else is consistent, pretty much. I yeah. have two scoops of, of, of aminos throughout the day, mm -hmm. every day. There you go. So, yeah. Next question. How do you know it's time to switch up your training program or schedule? From Mark Cunningham, and this one came from YouTube. This is a good question, and it I is. actually get yeah. this in my um, weekend Q&A that I okay. do on my personal Instagram. I get this question a fair bit, or you know, different variations of this question is, you know, when's it time to change up, should yeah. I change up, so on and so forth. What's your take on this? I guess there's two ways to think about it. I mean, from a training program perspective, usually around every kind of eight to 12 weeks, mm. I personally like to change my training program. Um, doesn't have to be all everything, but I like to get some different exercise orders, um, different reps, different sets, ranges, and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, really, it comes down to when you plateau in those exercises, yeah. when those exercises are no longer giving you the benefit or the result you desire. Yeah. Um, you need to change them up mm -hmm. so you can stimulate that muscle growth again. Mm -hmm. Your body's gonna adapt to what you are doing, you're gonna get stronger in them, yes, good, but if it's mainly kind of muscle growth that you're going for, you really wanna be stimulating your muscles as much as possible. Yeah. yeah. So changing that up is gonna stimulate and recruit different muscle fibers mm -hmm. through different movement patterns. For me personally, I agree with everything that you said. Mm -hmm. For me personally, my training split, so what muscle groups I train on what days and the order that I train them in, Yeah. Man, I change that maybe once every 18 months. Okay, yeah. I reckon, I yeah. reckon, because I'm thinking the last time I changed it was about 18 months ago. Yeah. And the time before that was probably another 18 months ago. Yeah. So my, that, let's call that my training schedule, yeah. does not change very frequently at all. Yeah. Once every year to two years. Mm -hmm. My actual workouts, those of you who follow me personally on Instagram, I post my workout summaries every, every day yeah. after I do them. They change every workout. Like I will very rarely do the exact same workout yeah. twice. Yeah. Or definitely not back to back. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I know if I'm training chest, I want to hit three pressing movements, a couple of flying movements, a pullover movement, and then it really just depends what I feel like doing on that particular day. Yeah. My arms movements, I know I'm gonna hit the positions of flexion, contracted, mid-range and stretched for my biceps and my triceps, but what exercises I choose to achieve that mm -hmm. changes. So for me, I kind of have, I guess, a training, a training schedule, a training split, yep. and then a training protocol, and then I pick and choose exercises that fit in there so it keeps it fresh and interesting. There you go, yeah. So, you know, it really depends on the individual. Some people, yeah. that would drive them nuts because they want to know exactly what exercise they're doing, yeah. exactly how many sets, how many reps we're trying to get because, you know, a lot of people just prefer that structure. Yeah. So, you know, I think it really depends on the individual. Yeah, I mean, I, I have my training program set, but a lot of the time I get into the gym mm -hmm. and it's busy, so I end up changing well, it Well, anyway. then that's the other thing, right? It's if like, you gotta go uh, leg day, you gotta do barbell squats, hack squats, leg press, leg extensions, hamstring curls, and you get to exercise number three, and um, someone's on a leg press. Yeah. Well, what are you gonna do? Yeah. You change that shit up. Exactly. So, next question. Weighing your food before or after cooking. I've been making 100 grams of potato in the air fryer. Now concerned, I have been <laughs> under tracking the amount of potato I'm consuming. Yeah. From Tori, uh, do you want to pronounce that? Uh, Snellex. Snellex. From, from YouTube. It's like Skrillex. Skrillex, but yeah, with Snell. Tori, Vince, what, what, what's the rule of thumb on uh, whether you should weigh raw or cooked 
for proteins and carbs. Consistency, really. Yeah. You need to be doing it either, if you're tracking it, you need to be tracking it raw consistently throughout everything. Yeah. Otherwise, if you're tracking it cooked, you need to be tracking it cooked consistently throughout everything. Mm-hmm. If you are paying for a program, however, mm-hmm. and the coach has put a certain amount in there, perhaps cooked and they haven't specified, yeah. Ask, you gotta ask. Um, because then, yeah, you could be under under consuming, over consuming yeah. um, the amounts you need. Mm. So proteins, if they put cooked weight and you're eating raw weight. Um, over consuming. Yeah. Mm. No, under consuming, because cooked weight is going to cook down to That's a true. smaller yep. raw weight. Yeah. So, yeah, you're then under consuming, which is not good, really. You're not going to mm. grow or lose weight, hold on to muscle tissue, whatever the kind of goal Whatever you're trying to achieve. You're trying to achieve. Yeah. yeah exactly. And I yeah. think you're hundred percent correct. You can, you know, you can weigh your your protein sources raw or or cooked. You can weigh your you know what I, I generally what I do is yeah. I go raw. Yeah. Because depending on how you cook different foods, yeah. depends how much the weight shrinks. Hundred percent. Like yeah. if you take a chicken breast for example let's say 200 grams of raw chicken breast, yep. and you grill it, yep. it's gonna shrink about 30%. Yep. Right? So it's gonna come down to about 140 cooked weight. Yep. But if you take that same 200 grams chicken breast and you bake it, it only shrinks about 20% because it yep. retains a lot of the moisture. moisture. Yeah. That's why it's like not as dry when you eat grilled versus baked chicken breast. So it's gonna yep. come down to like 160. Yep. So you know, consistency is the key, but yep. also consistency, if you're gonna weigh cooked, you need to be consistent in your cooking methods as well. Yeah. So for me personally, when I actually weigh my food out, I tend to weigh it raw. I personally do raw as well. Mm. Um, and I find it helps. I mean, I'm someone who likes to kind of cook my food in the morning yeah. and then have it for that day. Mm. If you're Sometimes if you're prepping for a whole week or something, weighing cooked might be easy to just buy a heap of shit, yeah. cook it, and then put it into containers. Yeah. Um, but I prefer raw. It makes shopping easier as well. It does. Um, and then, yeah, it's, cons- it's more consistent for me. 100%. Last question, Vince. The best way to keep your range of motion up from John Riggs from YouTube. Oh, I got two things here, John. The first one is enable yourself to actually achieve range of motion, yep. which is going to be achieved through stretching and mobility work. Mm-hmm. So, you know, as your chest is grown, you're actually still able to get full range of motion on your presses and your flies. Yeah. As your shoulders are growing, you're still able to get, you know, it's not, as you grow, you tend to lose mobility. So you need to counteract that by stretching and doing mo- like specific mobility work. Yeah. The second thing is try not to lift more weight than you can lift. Yeah. Because the first thing you do when you're, you know, you're trying to incline press uh, the, the 60s yeah. is you shorten your range of motion because you can't actually get full reps with the 60s. You yeah. haven't built the muscle, you're not strong enough. So instead of coming all the way down, pausing, coming all the way out for a squeeze, you're doing like quarter reps just yeah. to get them reps out. I agree with everything there, and that's pretty much the same as me. Your mm. prehab mobility work, yeah. making sure you're stretching after. Foam rolling's another good one as well. Mm. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much, and making sure you are going to full range of mo- motion on those movements. 100%. Yeah. Vince, that's a wrap. That's it. For this episode 20 of the Clinical Dose. Guys, if you've got any questions that you'd like us to answer in the next episode, we pick them up from a few different places as yeah. you've noticed in this yeah. episode, but the first place we always look is right here on the YouTube channel mm-hmm. in the comments down below. So just post your question in the comments down below. Vince is gonna go check those I'll first. Take a look. Grab the best ones from there and then add them to the list for the next episode of the Clinical Dose. As always, don't forget to hit the subscribe button, subscribe to the Massive Joe's YouTube channel, turn your post notifications on on whatever device you're watching this episode 20 on. Until next time, where we come to and from, Vince. MassiveJoe's.com. Stay massive. Thank you for tuning in to this video. We hope you enjoyed watching. Don't forget to check out our latest upload and our recommended video and be sure to subscribe to the Massive Joe's YouTube channel to stay up to date with all of our latest uploads.